Geordie. Welcome to the Big Travel Podcast. I'm Lisa Francesca Nand. Our guest today is utterly fascinating and I need to tell you more about her before I give her a proper Big Travel Podcast introduction because there just wouldn't be enough room. Lisa Forte is a cyber security expert who started her career in security, trying to stop pirates from attacking ships off the coast of Somalia. She moved on to UK counter-terrorism intelligence and the police cyber crime units, but now heads up her own company, Red Goat Cyber Security, and is one of the leading voices we have on cyber security issues. She's a professional speaker, trainer, entrepreneur, documentary personality, vlogger, as well as being an expert in risk management, insider threats and social engineering, and also been named as one of the top 100 women in tech. If this isn't interesting enough, Lisa is also an experienced climber, mountaineer and caver, and loves nothing more than spending her spare time when she actually has any, climbing the world's steepest mountains or popping over to Wales to spend a couple of days in the zero light depths of an abandoned abandoned mine. You can see why I couldn't fit all that into a good old big travel podcast introduction. But anyway, let's do this thing. Plotting against Somalian pirates from the Middle East, accidentally offending locals in South Korea, climbing frozen waterfalls in the Alps, climbing skyscraper height granite in Kazakhstan, spending her 21st birthday on Kilimanjaro, the deeply humbling experience of tracing long ago miners deep underground, cyber security, getting attacked by a gang of squirrels, and so much more. Cyber expert, climber, and caver Lisa Forte is on the Big Travel Podcast. You came to my attention on Twitter, as a lot of people seem to do, but a great name, by the way, also just because you're a Lisa, obviously. It's a great name, especially for what you do. But just sort of reading down your list of accolades, you're a cybersecurity expert, starting off your career in trying to stop pirates from attacking ships off the coast of Somalia, Yes, um, which see as a travel podcast, attacking or not attacking pirate ships, or it's trying to stop pirate ships attacking off the coast of Somalia. Sounds like a great place place to start tell us about that yeah so um I kind of uh, I did I did law at university actually and managed to get a job uh advising from the legal aspects of, of companies that protected ships from pirates and then by chance uh as so many aspects of my life and my story end up being uh completely by chance and opportunity someone took some maternity leave and I stepped into her job loved it. She didn't want to come back. And I sort of took on the sort of operations manager for, for dealing with that. So it was all about putting uh, armed guards on, on board commercial vessels, fortifying the vessels, putting sort of barbed wire up around them and sort of uh, building a citadel in the middle of the ship and um, sort of fortifying the ship as best as we could to prevent pirates from uh, getting on board. Because at that point in time, it was it was a massive, massive problem and a huge threat to commercial shipping. So a lot of private companies did, did this sort of work. So that's that's how I got into the world of security, I suppose. So were you um, there? Were you actually there? On Because I'm visualising you now, you know, sort of like a bandana <laughs> around your head, sort of holding onto a sail and your wind, the wind blowing back your hair. I think um, that would make it sound a lot cooler than it actually <laughs> was, to be honest. I prefer that image to the reality of, you know, most of it also being done sort of digitally and on a laptop. Uh, but yeah, I was in uh, in the Middle East, uh, spent a lot of time in the Middle East, in that area, in Oman, in the UAE in Qatar and and all the all the other places um working and and sort of sorting these things out for for the ship so it was a really good experience and I was I was quite young at the time so it was actually quite uh, an eye opener because I'd lev- lived quite a sheltered life uh, I would say and so it was a really great experience on a number of levels to see the reality of the world what was the reality i mean what really stands out for you in like a sort of nefarious operations type way well, I think, I think the complexity of things, you know, I think when you're sat in the UK in your comfortable lounge, it's very easy to reduce a situation to its binary concepts and sort of say, Oh, well, they're just bad people who are doing this bad thing. But what I've learned over the years working in, in that area and working also in, in cyber is that actually it's way more complex than that. And there's so many more factors going in 
to the to the mix that complicate it and make it murky. You know, there's a lot of things to be learnt from around the world um, and the problems that each country experiences, the problems that uh, that you see present in different societies and different cultures, because none of it is simple. That's the one thing I say I've learned the most, that it's never black and white. And I think sometimes, you know, if, historically, especially, but sometimes even non-historically, we are probably seen as the bad people doing bad things. Am I right? Definitely. And there are places in the world where, as a British person, you know, there there are... There's some animosity, and I think a lot of it is actually a quite understandable animosity, um, given some of the things that our country has not been involved in. You know, whether you agree with them or not, that animosity and that reputation does precede you. And uh, and I think we do the same thing to other cultures as well, right? But we'll all realise that the people of those countries are not the people who are deciding mm. the foreign policy. And I think that's the key thing to always remember, and especially through with the Russia-Ukraine crisis at the moment. There's a lot of people in Russia who I met actually in in Kazakhstan recently who are really good people who are really struggling and they're not the people who are making this decision. And we've got to be quite careful how to distinguish between, you know, those sorts of things, I think. There's there's countries that have been war-torn and had terrible reputations and would be, many people would be, uh, you know, scared of going to because we've been convinced, I don't know why the media or just because of the war situations or the so-called evil leaders of various countries have convinced that they're bad places and scary people. But actually, you know, I'd love to go places like Iran Iraq, Afghanistan, all of these really beautiful, beautiful places that have a lot of history and where people on the streets, and I'm sure you've found this, have are just welcoming lovely people living their lives the same as everyone else's. Yeah. And usually like their problems are the same as our problems. You know, what am I going to have for dinner? And, you know, oh, I'm not sure my son's doing well at school or whatever it is. Like by and large, human beings, you know, we're very, very similar, but for some reason we treat people of different countries as, as very different and and sort of give them some sort of a collective personality that they just don't have. So when you were mid- in the Middle East and, and dealing with the Somalian pirates, were you ever yourself, did you ever feel under threat or in danger? I think when I first sort of started working and, and existing in the Middle East, I wasn't totally clued up on all the cultural nuances that were expected. And there were a few situations where I overstepped the mark um, purely because of naivety on my part. I hadn't really appreciated what was expected of me in those situations. And that always shook me up a little bit. What I've learned from that is that actually, as a traveler, when you go to a country and you choose and you elect to go to a country, either for business or for, for tourism, it's your responsibility to understand the do's and don'ts. And yes, we expect other people to be a little bit accommodating as well. But very much, I think I've learned that it's very important to understand like any big cultural things that you shouldn't do or that's offensive. And I look those up before I travel to make 100% sure I'm not going to turn up and, you know, give British people a bad name in whatever country I've visited. Has there been any occasion where you've made a massive faux pas? So I made a sort of a, a really strange faux pas um, in South Korea, actually. Um, it was kind of, it wasn't an offensive thing, but in South Korea, when they go on these hiking trails, what I didn't realize was that you bring stuff for yourself, but you bring stuff for other people who you meet on the trail. And when you bump into them, what you do is you sort of exchange treats and food and drinks and have a little chat. And it's all sort of very friendly not something that you see in Europe, not something that you see in the UK. Uh, and I didn't have anything. And so I was causing all this offense <laughs> to these people who were offering me things. And I was like, no, I don't want your drink. Like, why would I want your drink? <laughs> and I was causing this offense without meaning to, because I just hadn't looked it up. And it happened so many times on this hiking trail. I went back and Googled it and I thought, oh my God, okay, I need to bring treats and snacks to share with these people because that's what's expected of me. So it's little things like that that I think, you know, it's it's really important. And I think that's when you travel, the key thing for me is to really experience those things because that's the country, that's the real country that you're in, um, as opposed to sort of staying in a resort and 
living a sort of sheltered existence within a country, it's really important to get out and have those experiences. So what were you doing in South Korea? That sounds amazing, apart from offending the locals by refusing to have their drinks, which I think sometimes I think sometimes our natural our natural instinct is to think, well, what's in the drink? You know, are you trying to drug me? Am I going to end up like, you know, back in some, you know, I don't know what's going to happen to me. You know, there is there is that sort of fear, you know, that suspicion, I think, sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. South Korea was wonderful. Just went. It was just a tourism thing, but um, absolutely loved it as a country. One of my top three places to go for sure. Um and I recommend people visiting. It gets very, very hot in the summer months. So July, August, I would avoid July, August. I went then, not a good idea, mm-hmm. but it's an absolute, absolutely fantastic country. So much to offer and just, just absolutely friendly, brilliant people. I remember you said to me, um, you said, Oh, I better tell you about what happened in Kazakhstan, but I think that's quite recent, isn't it? Yes. Um, when you were doing the, the the Somali pirates thing, what is like a really a sort of memorable moment that stands out? A really either really good moment or a or a scary moment or just like the day to day living aspect of uh, of where you were. What what sort of really stands out anecdotally? There was a couple of situations. Uh, one of them was actually quite interesting. It was I was actually back in the UK at the time, and I had a team who were on board a ship who were protecting it, um, armed people, who you know, ex-Royal uh, Marines from the UK, who were on board the ship protecting from pirates. And, you know, typically we'd seen the same type of attack play out time and time again, right? So we kind of knew the the way that pirates would attack a ship, or we thought we knew the way pirates would attack a ship. And in the a few weeks leading up to this event, there'd been some sort of, I guess, innovation on the pirates' behalf, mm-hmm. where they'd sort of decided to up their game a little bit with weaponry. Uh, and had done some pretty aggressive attacks on ships. But we hadn't seen that ourselves as a company, so we sort of carried on with the same procedure that we'd already had. Um, And I'm in a car, um, going to a barbecue or coming back from a barbecue, and I'm with my colleague and the the phone rings, and it's the team leader from on board the ship on his satellite phone saying, we've been approached, we've got two skiffs or three skiffs, whatever it was, uh, which are the sort of pirate boats that are approaching the vessel. And this was just kind of a a usual state of play. We had sort of escalation of how this would play out to to catalogue and log everything. Um, And so they escalated their their sort of use of force um, to deter them. There was water cannons and other stuff that you used to try and deter the attack. And the I get another call back and they were panicked. Absolutely hadn't heard my team ever sound like this ever. And they said they fired an RPG at the ship and the pirates had an RPG, which they'd fired at the ship and hit a cargo container. It's a rocket propelled grenade. Right. So it's a little bit like a handheld tiny missile. I suppose I would, I would describe it as, and it had basically thankfully not hit the ship. It had hit a cargo container on board the ship, but it was just this moment of just thinking, what on earth do we do now? Mm -hmm. And it's it's got me very interested in how we handle sort of incidents and crisis situations because in that moment i just felt like i sort of froze and i just thought i have no idea what to tell them to do i literally have no clue what to do now and it's just a horrible horrible situation to be in so as a result of that obviously we learned from it and we developed new procedures that were going to be able to cope with that kind of situation unfolding again in the future. But it just goes to show that, like, you know, there are things that are really unexpected in life that can happen that you, you're you not prepared for um, and, and really take you by surprise, I guess. I, I know that in your in your spare time, you're also spare time. Like you're, I can't believe you actually do this as well. And I think one of the things I that brought me to uh, you to my attention specifically on Twitter was these this incredible um footage that you were posting of your climbing and your <laughs> caving i mean yeah. that takes a huge amount of guts and bravery and i'm, I'm <laughs> sure you traveled extensively for that but actually just before we go on to that i'm trying to piece together how this girl who you know was very well spoken who went from <laughs> university studying law to you know suddenly being transported to the middle east and um fighting kind of not hand-to-hand combat but you know Somali pirates 
and then gets into the how does this all happen I mean how that how, what did you do did you get the did you get a call do they you know is it like at Cambridge where you think people are sort of recruited to be spies in the local <laughs> pub or something how did that no, it, it was just through networking to be honest and an opportunity came up to talk about um so what I'd obviously studied law at university and uh, the company that I worked for that was protecting ships from pirates um obviously part of what you do is you have weapons as a company that's all sort of legal and exported from the united kingdom but you have weapons that you put on board your ships to protect them used with the sort of private military um individuals who ex war marines whatever um but obviously there's an awful lot of legality that has to come with that for example you can't just enter a country's port with a whole load of weapons on board your ship that's completely illegal so you need someone who's studied international law who can advise on how we do that how we get the right paperwork set up and things like that so that's how I got into the company and then it was just so happened that someone who ran the operations of the team took maternity leave and I decided that I would offer to step in and help with her role while she was off loved it gave up my role and took on her role when she didn't come back. So what I've found in life is that actually there's a lot of situations where there's just an opportunity and it you take it and it takes you down a completely different route to where you thought it was going to take you. So a lot of my life might seem like I have this very convoluted path into everything, but actually there's just opportunities that have presented themselves that I've just taken and it's led me to new exciting things. It's sometimes you just got to say yes, haven't you? A hundred percent, and just take the risk, and even if go it's for scary, a hundred percent. Sometimes I think it's scarier not taking the risk and going for it. That's when I've made big decisions in my life, and I've made some big decisions that feel scary at the time. Sometimes I feel it'd be scarier to not do it than to actually do it. If that makes sense? Yeah, no, I, I agree, and I think often I feel like there's a lot of situations where if I don't take it because I'm scared. I'll regret it. And then I don't want to feel that regret. So it kind of drives me. Which brings me on nicely to the caving and the mountaineering, which scared the hell out of me when I thought when I saw the the sort of the precipices that you've been climbing. And the, <laughs> the, I saw this incredible picture that you posted the other day um, of an old mine that you were <laughs> climbing down, caving down, caving in climbing up whatever it was so tell us how did you how did you start what tell us about it yes yeah, so I'm um I'm a climber and I'm a caver um both of which I love I'm predominantly a climber but dabble in caving I suppose you could say as one does <laughs> as one does yeah. in her free time yeah. um yeah so I kind of got into climbing a really weird way most people get into it by kind of joining an indoor climbing gym in their town doing some indoor climbing, then maybe doing a little bit of outdoor climbing and so on and so forth. I started the other way and I actually started ice climbing. So right. that was my first introduction, climbing up frozen waterfalls in the Alps. Um, and then I moved into outdoor rock climbing and then I've only recently started doing indoor climbing. So I kind of right. went totally the opposite direction. to normal Let's start climbing. with the uh, the easy way, with the frozen waterfalls in the Alps. Is that right? <laughs> yeah, so just I, I absolutely love it. I think it's um. Both climbing and caving are both very interesting because they both challenge you hugely mentally. Mm. And I think a lot of people sort of say, oh, it's a, it's sort of a, you're an adrenaline, adrenaline junkie. And I always say to them, something's gone very wrong in a, in a climb or in a cave. If you are experiencing adrenaline, right? Like, okay. A yeah. very big mistake has happened. If you're experiencing that, it's very much about remaining in control of the situation, managing risk. Um, and yeah, I, I really, really enjoy it. And I've climbed all around the world, um, which is brilliant. And yeah, I also explore abandoned mines in the UK, which is very dangerous for anyone listening. Don't go and explore abandoned mines unless you're with someone who is qualified uh, and capable to take you down. Um, but they are absolutely fabulous time capsules, which I just, I, I'm just fascinated by. Where in the world has been your, your most uh, awesome climb? Oh, well, it's difficult because the Alps are awesome. Um, the Andes are awesome. Uh, but recently I went to Kazakhstan um, and it's a bit of a funny story. And this is very a uh, sort of hallmark Lisa moment, really, for anyone who knows me. I was on a forum looking up uh, granite climbing, sort of big wall granite um, 
mountainous areas and where the best places for that were outside of the United States. And there was a, a very brief comment from somebody that said something about Kazakhstan. And I thought there was nothing more written on it. And I thought that's a bit weird. OK, maybe I'll look into this. There was basically nothing at all written on climbing in Kazakhstan. It's not a well-traveled country uh, from a European or US perspective. And I thought, OK, I'm just going to give this a go. So I booked a flight. I booked an apartment on Airbnb um, and I just sort of went <laughs> and I kind of decided I was going to go and just see what, if anything, existed in Kazakhstan to climb. <laughs> so that's what I did, which I think most of my friends thought I was absolutely nuts. But it was an absolutely fabulous experience. And the climbing was probably some of the best climbing I've ever seen in my life. Really describe it to us. What does it look like? What's the region? You know, describe it. So I was in Almaty, which if you think of Kazakhstan as a massive, is this massive country sort of a bit like Europe as a sort of size guide. It's kind of in the bottom right of Kazakhstan. It's right on the Chinese border and it's absolutely huge mountains, huge, huge mountains, um, very quickly getting up to some pretty significant altitude, actually. And you sort of go up into the mountains and there are these walls of rock, which are just they're like skyscraper heights of rock, absolutely enormous walls of granite rock. But because it's so um it hasn't been traveled an awful lot. They're basically untouched. So the rock is just pristine, clean rock that people haven't been climbing over for years. I mean, one of the problems we have in the UK, we don't have an awful lot of climbing. And the climbing that we do have has been climbed for, for you know, almost, I don't know, 80 years, 70 years, something like that. Um, and so it's very polished. Lots of people have been scrambling over it. So bits of rock have been pulled off and, and so on and so forth. So it's it's not very pristine. It's not very kind of as it was at all. And in Kazakhstan, this was completely the opposite. It was just like unclimbed. And one of the, I met up with a couple of other people who are climbers are very sociable people. So we just sort of meet up with other climbers and climb together. Um, even if you've never met each other before. And they were sort of saying to me that, you know, there is just so many routes and mountains that had never been climbed at all, that were still waiting for their first ascent in this area, which was just amazing to me. So I had an amazing time there and uh, I'll be going back next year for sure to go and try to put up some first ascents on some of those walls. What's the uh, what's the best view you've ever seen? Um, One of the best moments was in my climbing life, I think, was actually in Kilimanjaro many, many years ago for my my 21st birthday. My father and I, my father also climbs. Um, we decided that for my 21st, which was quite a long time ago, I won't tell you how many years ago that was because that will give many things away, but it was a while ago. We decided we were going to go and climb Kilimanjaro, just the two of us. Um, and this was before it sort of became really commercialized. And we timed it so that the time we got to the summit was the moment I turned 21 Amazing. and it was this absolutely pristine day, not a cloud in the sky. The way Kilimanjaro is because it's a volcano. It's almost one of the only places where you, you can't see the curvature of the earth because you're not high enough, but it looks like you can because of the plains of Africa below you. And to see this red, fierce red sunset coming up over the plains of Africa was just the most amazing moment, probably. And it was something that will stick with me forever. Um, so it was a pretty epic way to turn 21. That sounds fantastic. Really good. And to do that with your dad as well, that's so special. Yeah, 100%. I mean, we do joke afterwards that because of altitude, sickness and everything else, you're still vomiting like you would if you were out in a bar in the UK somewhere. So you get the same experience of turning 21. I think that was my experience of 21, actually, was dancing on the bar and uh, doing shots somewhere in some Spanish bar on the on the coast of Spain. So, yeah, you were doing far more... Uh, reaching far dizzier heights in many many ways than one yeah. um and has there any been ever been any moments during your mountaineering because it looks terrifying to me um mm -hmm. where you you've actually been in in danger yeah I think it's something that's come up a lot recently 
I've lost quite a few friends, um, friends that I grew up climbing with who unfortunately have lost their lives in the mountains. Um, it's one of the things that unfortunately is part and parcel of it. Some famous climber says that, you know, climbing is this really weird sport where when it's going well, you're celebrated and everyone's cheering and it's wonderful and it's the best thing in the world. But when it goes wrong, people unfortunately lose their lives and it becomes almost impossible to justify why you're doing it. Um, and it's a really difficult situation. I've been in a couple of situations where, um, up in a mountain where I came up a kind, kind of up a gully, got to the top traversing this ridge and another gully avalanched. And there were four people in that gully when it avalanched. And unfortunately, um, they all died. And just being on the same mountain when that happened was quite traumatizing. Um, so it is a very risky sport. And I've been in situations rock climbing where I've taken some really big falls. And I've actually had a situation. So a lot of the climbing that you do, you put in your own gear. So you use metal nuts or cams, which are sort of sort of pinchy, squeezy devices that you put in cracks in the rock to protect it. And sometimes when you fall, um, they'll hold. And sometimes when you fall, they won't hold. And you're hoping that you've put enough in that something somewhere is going to catch the fall. Um, and I took a really nasty fall where two pieces of gear below me came out. So I fell an awful long way and smacked straight into the rock, broke my ribs, broke my hand blood everything um and I was so it was quite well it's not funny but it was quite funny looking back on it now because the person who was belaying me was sort of asking if I was okay and I, I turned around to him and I said yeah yeah I'm fine I don't know why there seems to be water running down my face <laughs> and he said oh Lisa that's not water it was like oh no 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 I'm bleeding that's what's happening um but you it's it's one of those things I think that in all of these adventurous sports there is a risk and you have to accept that and try and minimize it as much as you possibly can by being strong, by making sure you know what you're doing, et cetera, et cetera. But these environments aren't safe. It's like the mines, you know, they're not safe environments. We can't protect them. It, they're never going to be like walking around Tesco's. Um, but at the same time, if you don't take those relatively calculated risks, you don't get to experience those environments and you don't get to see what those environments have to offer. T tell us about the mines then. Oh, the mines are wonderful. Everyone thinks I'm absolutely barking <laughs> mad. <laughs> I think my parents think they have no idea what went wrong. My sister is this lovely homemaker and I'm this crazy person who goes down <laughs> mines. Um, well, the mines are really interesting. So there's a really rich history in North Wales in the UK of slate mining and other stuff like that. And all these mines largely were abandoned in the early 1900s. So they have been abandoned a very long time indeed. Um, and when they were abandoned, like a lot of the stuff just got left in them because it didn't make any financial sense to pull it out. Mm. So you've got cranes and you've got miners' boots and hats. And um, there's one mine that I go into where there's hobnail boots from the miners that you can still see the hobnail boot marks in the tunnels from the 1900s. And you can see the pit pony uh, horseshoe marks in the tunnels. Um, and it's like, it's just this amazing experience because you kind of go in there and you feel like you're walking into this environment that's a time capsule. Mm. And in some ways, you're kind of bringing back to life the people who existed in that environment and recognizing their existence in a sense. Yeah, that makes absolute sense. And that sounds very, uh, that's very evocative. You know, I can almost, while you're saying that, I can almost hear the, uh, the clink of the metal and the, the ponies and the sounds. I can almost feel it. And you must get the same sense. I want so much more of a sense when you're actually down there. Yeah. And yeah, it's just, it's just a great experience, really. And I think it's, it, it's obviously not a safe environment. Um, you have to be very careful. You have to be quite experienced as a caver to be able to negotiate those kinds of environments as safely as possible. But it is a really great way to kind of see some history that isn't in a museum. And for me, that feels like a really authentic experience. And 
that's what I'm after in most of the things I do. How you, how do you get down the shaft? Do you abseil down or the lifts? Yeah, no, no lifts. Um, so what, well, there were lifts at one point, weren't there? Some, some sort of, of them might have lifts, but obviously you abseil down now. So you need to be able to um, use ropes, use harnesses. Uh, SRT, which is a way of climbing up a rope, um, things like that. Um, and, and obviously there's a lot of risks with it. So a lot of people, I took actually one of my good friends, I took down um, her first mine a few weeks ago. And I said to her, you know, a, a mine and a cave, that there's zero light environments and you don't really appreciate what that means until you turn your head torch off and you realise that there's really not another place that you've experienced that is completely zero light. You cannot see anything at all. And it's just one of these environments that you think, wow, you know, <laughs> if your head torch ran out of batteries, you would be in really serious trouble. Um, so there's lots of ex- sort of points about equipment and stuff like that, that you have to be aware of, but it's just, it's just, I, I can't really describe it. It's this, it's like you're walking back in time and seeing things that, may not have been seen for you know 80 100 years maybe I'd be curious that my mind wanders a little bit but I think of the family members of the people who work down there and there'll probably be elderly grandchildren of people that work down there that'd be fascinated to speak to you and hear about your experiences yeah and I I actually met one who was talking to me about a, a particular mine in North Wales a slate mine and um we went down there together and he was explaining to me that there was a section there that I'd sort of seen before, but I hadn't sort of clocked what it was. And he said, well, this is, this is the morgue. And I went, Oh my God, this is, this is the morgue. And he said, yeah, yeah. And you'll see all over the the ground behind it are all these boots. And we flashed our flashlights over it and you could see all these boots and they were all the boots from the miners who died because unfortunately, the, the sort of superstition within the mine was that it was bad luck for the boots to leave the mine. So they took the boots off the people who unfortunately had had an accident and scattered them. And then just seeing the, the piles of boots took a number that you, you knew the number of people who'd had accidents. But when you see it in that way, it's like, oh, my God, I don't know how to process this. It was insane. Did you find that it must have been incredibly eerie, but do you ever get scared when you're in a mine generally? Um, I, I think probably when I first started doing it a very long time ago, yes. Um, but now not so much. Uh, I think I sort of n- know the environment. I think that there is this slight feeling sometimes that you're kind of, very isolated and obviously the problem is you're underground so you can't call for help so you can't make a phone call if you break your leg and say can someone come and help me because there is no phone signal so you are quite isolated um and that can sometimes make you feel a little bit occasionally you just get that thought come into your mind and you have to sort of put it to one side and carry on but um but no generally speaking not anymore i don't uh i don't feel particularly scared of the situation. Uh, I think very, I think I probably feel quite more kind of conscious about being really respectful of the environment in the sense of, you know, this was where people had to work insanely hard, had very difficult lives. Some people lost limbs, some people lost their lives, et cetera, et cetera. And sort of being very respectful of the things that you find in there. Um, almost like a memorial, I suppose. That's definitely very much at the forefront of my mind. Particularly that row of boots in the morgue. Hundred percent. Yeah, yeah. And and it, I found out afterwards from some, from some research with regards to that particular mine, if people had an accident at the time, and this is obviously in the 1900s, they would take them out the mine, take them back to their house, put them in their bed, and leave them there because if the person died in their bed in their house, it wasn't documented as a mine death. So they managed to get off the liability of having that person die in their mind. And it's just insane to me that 
this was happening in the country that I now live in that has all the sort of health and safety protocols that we yeah. have. It's like, yeah. we've come a long way we in, have in a short a period way. of time. <laughs> Just imagine what that, um, what that journey would have been like if you, you know, if you're, very very critically injured injured it just reminded me a a while back I went to see my great-grandfather's grave in the fields in Flanders and we had a tour of the of the battlefields and where he died and everything and it's only that and until that time I hadn't thought about how he was shot twice and how you know many people were were Mm -hmm. injured and had to be transported on horse and cart amongst amidst the really really thick sticky mud you know for several miles until they got to a hospital a field hospital and I'm just likening it to that journey what that must have been like when you're very severely injured and you've got to be carried out you know and yeah it must have been awful yeah I think I think those things bring areas to life though in a sense you know this being able to relate to other human beings and what they must have gone through and sort of sometimes sitting in these minds which sounds like a bizarre thing to be saying on your (laughs) podcast but sitting in these minds looking around and thinking like this was someone's job every single day and I moan about mine where I'm sat in my lovely warm house with my nice lighting and my coffee machine and these people were down these mines for in darkness basically for majority of their working life yeah, risking their lives every moment. Yeah. And it's really, I can picture you down there. And I think it's really respectful and it's really nice to acknowledge, to acknowledge it. Um, so caving, add in. So being down a mine is one thing. Being down a cave where it's not, you know, necessarily a, a cut, uh, route and you've probably got, I don't know, water, underground <laughs> lakes. Tell us about the caving. My goodness. Caving is, is different again. Uh, and a different challenge again, because Mines were obviously built for human beings, right? Mm -hmm. So you can stand up and you can walk around and everything's very logically laid out because it's designed for human beings. But caves have been carved out by rivers over sort of the history of the earth, really. And they haven't had humans taken into consideration when they're made. So they have constrictions, which um, are sort of very tight tunnels, I suppose, that you have to try and squeeze your way through. Uh, lots of water and stuff like that that happens. But they're basically like, um, I guess like a, an underground assault course would be how I describe them. Um, they're great, great fun. They're actually incredibly safe environments. People are very, very scared of caves. Um, but actually they, they're very solid. They very, very rarely collapse. There's never really any danger of that kind of thing happening. The biggest danger is you're going to get lost. But for the most part, they're very, very safe environments and they're great fun. And they're a great way to get some really good exercise in the UK during the winter when, you know, hiking's a bit miserable, climbing's not possible because it's too wet. Your options are limited. So you go underground. Have we got a lot of caves here? Yes, especially in Cheddar. Cheddar has an awful lot of caves and it has one cave in particular called Swildens Hole, which is one of the largest cave systems that we have. And it's, this place is, is unbelievable. It's got waterfalls underground and it's absolutely so beautiful. Funnily enough, this is the same place that the two gentlemen who headed up the Thai cave rescue are from. They're from there. Oh, I see. Yeah. So they're, they're from there and they dive in that area in caves. Um, so it's, it's a, a, a hot area for, for caving is cheddar. And has has the caving taken you around the world as well? Uh, not so much, um, mainly just the climbing. We, we don't have very deep caves here in the UK just because of how our rock is is sort of, I say designed, like someone designed it, but, you know, how our rock is set yeah. up. We don't get very deep caves. However, in sort of France and Spain, they have some epic caves where some of my caving friends have gone and spent an entire week underground, an entire week's holiday in a cave underground. It's insane. I love it. So there you are fighting the in cybercrime on a day to day basis. And in your spare time, you're climbing the most terrifying rocks and going <laughs> down into mines and caves. Um, I could speak to you forever, but I have to wrap it up soon. So just before I ask you my last question, which is always about music, I'm going to ask you, oh, A, is there any any sort of um, travel story you think I've I've missed? Any travel stories? Yeah, that that any like really good story from your travels you think I might have missed? Um, 
Oh, I got, I got seriously, well, not seriously assaulted, but I got assaulted by a large quantity of squirrels in Kazakhstan <laughs> who, uh, there's photos of them on my Instagram and on, uh, on my Twitter. So you can, you can see them on there, but these crazy looking squirrels that had the bushiest ears and they, they were basically, I've never experienced anything like it. They basically surround you and start climbing up your leg and up your, up your back and all over you. And I was sort of sat there at the bottom of this climbing wall thinking, what on earth is going on? And my friend from Kazakhstan said, Oh, they're after any sugar you have on you. And they could smell that I had a candy bar in my pocket and they were literally climbing all over me. It was a very strange experience. And again, something that I really haven't experienced before. So I was a bit kind of taken aback by it. That but that was always... terrifying. Yeah, like, it was I'm thinking of in a Charlie and the Chocolate Factory where the, oh, is it Veruca Salt? One of the girls yeah. gets carried off by the squirrels. and uh, Exactly. That's that what happened. Bad nut. Yeah. <laughs> Brilliant. I love it. Um, I, I actually, I said, A, is there any, anywhere I'd forgotten to ask you about? And then B, I'd forgotten what B was going to be. So it doesn't matter. Um, but what I was going to ask you about before I ask you my last question is just the state of cybersecurity at the moment. I mean, don't terrify us, maybe terrify us if you have to, but I know in 2020, you uh, co-founded a cyber for good movement called Cyber Volunteers 19, uh, where you helped protect hospitals around Europe from cyber attacks during the pandemic. Um, I I know uh, that's that's mainly your field. What what's the biggest concerns in cybersecurity right now? How scared, oh, scared should we be? Very. I, I think you know we've right. got to be we've got to be we've got to be more concerned about digital security. We're very very good at physical security. We don't leave our handbags on the front seats of our car. We lock our front doors. We are mindful of physical security, and we have to become more mindful of that in a digital sphere because that's how we live with our lives now. And unfortunately, cyber criminals are very well funded and they're very organized and they're very uh, quick to adapt. For instance, you've seen you may have even had some of these yourself, text messages and emails coming through saying click on this link to review your energy bill. You know, already with this crisis, they've mobilized tactics to try and get you to click on links. Um, And they're very, very innovative in that in that respect. And so you have to treat everything you do online with a healthy degree of skepticism i said i think and be a little bit more paranoid with what you do and share online and what you engage with i think because just because you're not a big business doesn't mean you don't have money or assets that could be stolen yeah absolutely good advice okay my last question is always about music and i'm going to ask you to name if i asked you to name one song that reminds you, I don't know if you listen to music actually when you're climbing or or traveling, you probably need to concentrate more than that. But if you can think of a moment when you were listening to a song and it reminds you of a special or memorable or a time of and place of travel, what is that song and what were you, what is the memory? It's not because it's a favorite song of mine, but it, it's uh the song Price Tag by Jesse J. And the reason it sticks in my mind when you ask me that is that when I was in Kazakhstan, I was in this taxi. It was a really long taxi journey and the driver didn't really speak any English. And my Russian is basically limited to ordering coffee. Um, and so there was nothing really to communicate. And then over the radio came on this Jesse J song price tag and he started singing it because he knew the words. And I started singing it because I knew the words. And there was this kind of moment where we couldn't communicate but we both knew the words of this Jesse J song and we were singing along in the car laughing at each other. And it was kind of this, yeah, it's just a really weird moment, but it was a nice way to have a connection with someone who you can't really communicate with. I love that. I love that. I've had so many moments singing in taxis around the world or even here (laughs) or just where those moments when, you know, everything's foreign and might be a bit difficult and you don't know what you're doing, but it's exciting. And then music suddenly connects you. That's precisely why I asked that question. (laughs) Thank you so much for coming on the Big Travel Podcast. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much, Lisa. And thank you for listening to the Big Travel Podcast. We'll be back every two weeks with a brand new episode. Please like and subscribe on whatever app you're using. Thank you very much. Hello, I'm Helen from Flixwatcher. 
And I'm Kobe, also from Flix Watcher. The Netflix review podcast you go to when you can't find anything to watch on Netflix. That's right. We are another podcast in the strip media family. So if you've struggled to find a film on Netflix, then we're the podcast for you. And we have guests from other podcasts, big and small. And they're the ones that actually choose the films that we then rate and review and talk about in our show. If you'd like to find out more about Flix Watcher or any of the other shows, visit www.strip.media to find out more.